Hey, Tom. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship this morning. So good to see all of you here. Um, a number of announcements about events in the life of our congregation. Lent begins on the 22nd of this month. It's coming fast. And with that come a number of activities added to our normal schedule. We, uh, the churches here in Clays will We'll begin their Lenten lunches, as you see in the bulletin, on March the 1st. We're hosting one, I think, at the very end of March. Is that right? 29th? Something like that. Uh, the Lenten gatherings are also going to be starting again. And uh, thanks to Karen and to Cheryl for helping to plan that, organize it, and promote it. I guess this is not done, right? <laughs> More work to do, but, uh, but they have been instrumental in helping get that started again. Uh, we will be hosting one uh, the last Sunday of March. We'll be talking more about that 
uh, as we get closer to that date. And we'll be saying more about those gatherings and what are happening uh, in a couple of weeks. Today is Super Bowl Sunday, as you know. Uh, the, the church in many parts of our country have for years uh, uh, taken that day to uh, recognize Super Bowl, S-O-U-P-E-R, uh, Bowl Sunday, and collect food and money for local food banks, and we too are doing that. If you have something to contribute, please leave it here or bring it uh, next week. I'm sure it will still be welcome. Uh, note also in your bulletin uh, that we have uh, a church yard sale coming up again. I believe it's going to be a week earlier, though, than listed here. So just note that, and if you have things to bring, bring them in. Uh, the one room downstairs is really filling up. If you can't find a place to put it, I'm sure see Cheryl, and she can help you with that. Uh, wonderful thing to be doing together this spring. Yeah. Let us worship God together. Thank you.
in the prayer of confession. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess the day of trial and life from you, for we have lived on all. We have lived for ourselves and by heart for you. We have turned from our neighbors and the Jesus to bear the burdens of others. We have made more of your pain in the world and ask God the hungry, the war, and the oppressed. And you have great mercy and give our sins and free us from selfishness that we may be true to the Lord and obey your commandments. Let us continue our prayer of confession with a moment of silence. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. Be assured that in Christ Jesus you have been forgiven. Glory be to God. so many it's hard to choose. Can you think of two or three sort of favorites? Okay. Well, think about the ones that you really like the best. Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions. What would it be like if your mom and dad said, we know some children who don't have enough toys to play with, and we want you to pick out one toy to give to them. Could you do that? Just one. Could you do that? You're thinking. <laughs> you think maybe you could get just one? Let me ask you, let me ask you a harder question. What if they said, I want you to pick out one toy to give to somebody else, but it's got to be one of your most favorite toys? Now, that would be hard, wouldn't it? What about this? What if they said, we're going to help these children who don't have enough toys, and we want you to give all your toys away? Now, that would really be tough, wouldn't it? I think all of us would say the same thing. That's the hard thing. That word all is a big word, but you know that we find that word in the Bible in lots of places. Um, and it's kind of scary sometimes to think that God might ask us to give everything we have for his sake, to serve him, because we love him. There's a verse that we'll be talking about a little bit this morning. Uh, it comes in the book of Deuteronomy, and you've probably heard it before. It's very famous. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. With everything you've got, love God. Everything. Now that doesn't mean, I don't think, that God is going to come to you and say, now listen, I want you to give up all your toys. Like I was saying, it would be a hard thing to do. But what it does mean is that we ought to love God so much that we would be willing to give up anything we were asked to give up if it was going to be for his good and the good of what God's trying to do in the world because God has given everything up for us. He loves us that much. And that's a nice part of that to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Well, enjoy your toys. Think about 
as you grow up, all the things that God has done for you and what, how God calls us to love him with everything we have, everything about us, we are to commit to him. That's a big job we have for the rest of our lives. Okay? Let's pray and ask God to help us with that. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, that you did not hold anything back from us, but you sent us Jesus Christ, your son, to live for us and to give his life for us. So help us as we return that love just a little bit to think about how we might open ourselves to serving you as completely as we can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. New Testament lesson comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, reading verses 21 through 48. 
You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable for judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that if anyone divorces his wife except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it, that it was said of those in ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and takes your coat, Give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your enemy, you shall love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For that for, for so that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, let now the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Martin Luther, the great reformer, famously drew a distinction between law and gospel. He said, the law is that which shows us our flaws and helps to cut them out of us as we think of them. But the gospel is that which heals us, that gives us life, that renews and revives us. We all may recognize the difference between those two, and it, they just follow the comments of the Apostle Paul in a number of places in his letters, like Romans and Galatians, where he says we are saved by grace through faith, the gospel, not by works of the law, lest anyone should boast. Now this distinction between law and gospel actually does not divide scripture quite as neatly as we might think. But 
what is striking to me is that we often think of the law as something that is demanding that we can't live up to, and the gospel as something that maybe lets us off the hook. When we read the words of Jesus this morning, then what we surely must see is that, in fact, in many ways, it's the opposite that is the case. That knowing God's grace puts a demand on our lives, a calling on our lives, that ask everything of us. The law of Moses, like any law, gave us in its details standards to follow that in a way are minimal standards. At least that's the way communities of faith, Jews and Christians, have often read it and tried to apply it. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were specialists at this. They were really about something that was quite noble when you think about it. We had all of these injunctions given by Moses in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And they seemed quite inaccessible to most people. And so the Pharisees set out, as they said, to put a fence around the law, to give guidelines about how the average person could obey it. They wanted to explain the law so that every common person would be able to follow it, to reduce it down to its minimal standards. And so, one of the most famous examples, don't work on the Sabbath. But that raises the question, well, what then is work? I mean, people have to prepare food, and some people are farmers, and there's necessary work to do. What is permitted on the Sabbath? And so the Pharisees developed these laws, these guidelines about what work is and is not. And so people following their teachings, their guidelines, found ways to observe the Sabbath while doing those basic duties that they had to do. They still could say, we are not working. There was another group uh, in about Jesus' time called the Essenes who were maybe even more consumed with this than the Pharisees were. They were so concerned to live according to the Mosaic law, they thought that in normal society they couldn't do it. And so they moved out into the desert, down next to the Dead Sea, where uh, the, the body of water that has no life in it, harsh living in that hot climate where there was no fresh water, and then they made a life for themselves, austere, removed from normal society. And they also came up with their own guidelines about how to obey the law of Moses. On the Sabbath law, they determined that to work meant to walk more than 500 paces. And so there they set their regulation, 500 paces we can go, and up to that, not be working. They also set strict purity laws for themselves, so they could not put a latrine within their settlement. They had to put it a certain distance outside the camp. Archaeologists uncovering this settlement were kind of amused to see that the latrine was more than 500 paces from the edge of the camp. So we wonder how these people must have been bound up in their regulations. We imagine this group of pious, ascetic Jews standing at the edge of the camp on the Sabbath day, waiting anxiously for the sun to go down over the hills, and then a race to the latrine. We think about the law as something that is a minimal standard. And thinking about that is not always a bad thing. Sometimes, as we think about how to live in the, in the imperfect world in which we live, considering that minimal standard that God might put on us can be a helpful thing. St. Augustine was doing this very thing when he began to ponder what it meant not to kill the commandment that we not take another's life. And he began to wonder how this applies to warfare and other similar martial conflicts. He developed then from that the idea 
of just war. Thinking that in an imperfect world in which we're not supposed to kill, we sometimes see forces of evil taking advantage of the innocent. The attack by powerful forces on those who are helpless and what is one to do when observing it? Do we not kill in any circumstance? Augustine thought this must simply mean not to murder, not to intentionally take another life, especially an innocent life, but there were certain ways we could consider taking a life if it meant that we were defending someone who was innocent, oppressed, at the edge of life. Sometimes thinking in these minimal ways is helpful. The problem with this, however, is that we can come to think so much about how little is expected of us that we miss the point completely that God calls us to commit ourselves completely to him. And so Jesus spoke with that concern to his followers in the Sermon on the Mount from which we read this morning. You have heard it said of old, but I say to you, Jesus in these sayings, this series of sayings in which he posed common ideas about morality and ethics, Christian behavior. You can do certain things. You can set your sights on the minimal that you can do, but I'm calling you to something higher than your, than our feeble minds can ever imagine. Reach instead for what the Creator dreams for you, for what the God who has made you and redeemed you has shown you in his own love for you. And so in this, Jesus introduces these teachings in this passage, constantly with this line, but I say to you, to remind us that our life with him calls us to something higher than we can ever completely reach. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, in his quotations of what has been heard of old, is citing some common ideas about morality and right behavior in his own day. And at each point, he says, this is simply not enough for my followers. Some of the passages are from the Old Testament. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness. And Jesus says at each turn, these are good and right, but we need to push them even further in order to fulfill the real spirit of the law. He said, you have heard it said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's a really interesting one because that law in and of itself, as you may know, is kind of radical in that many people in the ancient world said, if someone harms you and you lose an eye, you can take that person from that person, both eyes and both ears or anything else. You might also go to a member of that person's family and exact from them a punishment. The law in the Old Testament is intended to limit the punishment to the person who gave the offense in the first place and to limit it so that one could not seek vengeance without limits. But Jesus says, as good as that may be, as radical as it may have been when it was put out, think about something even higher still. Someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek as well. And then Jesus cited a passage that is actually not in the Old Testament. The first part is love your neighbor. The second part is not, but hate your enemy. This is kind of understandable. A lot of people might want to live by this, but Jesus said, what good is that? How does that set you apart from anybody else? Anybody can love those who love them. Jesus had said earlier, that he was not about overturning the law of Moses, but fulfilling it. 
we remember that Moses said in introducing the law in Deuteronomy, the line that I mentioned with the children a few moments ago, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Jesus in these sayings seems to be telling us what all might mean, giving us illustration after illustration about what it might mean to go beyond the bare minimum of the law of Moses, which intended to illustrate faithfulness to God, but to really love God completely calls us to something bigger than all of that. Jesus here giving us examples of what all looks like. We have seen it, I think, in our own lives, haven't we? As we see examples of radical faithfulness, think about that command, honor your father and your mother, which in its context seems to have meant as your parents grow old, don't neglect them, take care of them when they need you. And it meant particular things to ancient Israelites, maybe different things to us. I remember a young couple when I was in graduate school. The young man was in my class at Union Seminary. Good, faithful people. And this woman's father came down with brain cancer. Now, they were living in a tiny apartment in Richmond. He, in the throes of his PhD studies, lots of stress, no money, but thinking about that command and what it meant for them, they brought her father into their little apartment. They put their work on hold for a number of months, and they cared for him, nursed him, accompanied him to his death, and we all watched in awe as they blew apart the minimal standards of what that commandment might mean and opened themselves to the fullness of what it meant to them. Some of you have seen it, experienced it, and responded to it when your adult child calls and says, I really need your help. And you take days off work, you put everything on hold, and you travel, you spend money, you go and fill the needs that are being expressed to you. Jesus himself gave the most radical response to God's call on his life so that he gave himself completely for us. And as the Apostle Paul says in that beautiful hymn in Philippians, he gave himself over to us even to the point of death, even the most excruciating, humiliating death on the cross. He gave everything for us, and so he calls us to consider the demand of the gospel on our lives, to give everything we have, to forgive, to love in ways that we perhaps can't even imagine. This is Christ's call on us. Remember back in 2006, a man named Charlie Roberts entered an Amish school over near Lancaster. He killed 10 children in an attack on that school. And it was a horrible story, but the most amazing part of the story was what came next, as you probably remember. The, the members of that Amish community, some of them who had lost children in the attack, uh, went to meet with this man who had killed himself also in the attack, went to meet his widow, and they prayed with her, and they attended his funeral service, and they declared to everyone that they forgave him for what he had done to them, to their families, to their community. One reporter uh, who was narrating all this in amazement said, what these people have done in response to this great injustice done to them is simply unheard of. But what they were doing was following the example of Jesus and this teaching that he gives us in this very passage. 
The point Jesus makes to us is, in response to God's love for you, in response to God's grace known in his sacrifice, do the unheard of. This, in fact, hard as it is to reach for, it is our creed and it is our witness. So listen for the voice of Jesus in whatever circumstance we are in, and whatever minimal standard of behavior, whatever little bit seems right and acceptable, Jesus says to us, but I say to you, Especially for we thank you for the promises of Scripture, the promises lived out since creation and among your people Israel and in the ministry of Jesus Christ, your faithfulness to them and to us, your constant presence with us that we certainly feel and know. All this that gives us hope for today and for tomorrow. We give you thanks for the fellowship of believers that we know here, for the closeness brought to us by your spirit which binds us together. 
We thank you for signs of your greatness that we see in creation all around us, for the beauty of your world, for the singing of birds that reminds us of how important it is to rely on you each day and to give praise to you, to let our voices rise up to you in song and in prayer. We give you thanks for the blessing of family and for the family of God, for the love that we know from all of them, signs of your grace to us. We give you thanks especially today for a great grandchild born to June Butler, Griffin Robert Butler. We thank you for the health of all and for the blessing on them and pray your continued work and presence in June's life and in her family's life. O oh God of grace, we know that so many of your children this day, near to us and far away from us, are suffering in one form or another. And so we also, as part of our claim of your faithfulness, lift up their needs to you today. We pray for those who are too often forgotten, out of sight from us, those bound to home or to hospital. We pray especially today for Dick Mellon and for Don Hickman. We pray for those who are victims of tragedy and disaster and particularly this day we lift up to you the people of Turkey and Syria for the many lives that have been lost and the families that mourn them for the many who have had lives disrupted for the many who were homeless we pray for them and for your work in that place for relief agencies and agents of your goodness and mercy who were there and on their way there. We pray for those who suffer mental anguish and depression. We pray for those who are working and who have spent their lives trying to relieve suffering and those who have devoted themselves to sharing your gospel, your word of hope with the whole world. O oh, shepherd of our souls, we pray that you would be with us. Continue to guide and comfort us, to be with those who are in desperate circumstances, with people like Gracie Patton, who struggles with cancer at only four months old. We pray for all those who suffer this day, that you might guide them as you guide us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who gives us hope, who we believe and he will usher in your kingdom and make all things new, and who also has taught us to pray in hope, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. With temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Truly, as St. Augustine said, all we have, we have received from the hands of God. And so we worship by giving our tithes and offerings. Would you worship by giving as the ushers wait on you?
give may seem small and inadequate, but remind us that Jesus took a few loaves and fish, blessed them and broke them and gave them out to feed a multitude. So we pray that you would do the same with the gifts that we bring. Gifts of money, of time, of talent. Take them and with your spirit, do things with them that we cannot do with them, with them ourselves. Share the gospel with the whole world, the good news that you're reconciling the world to yourself in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs> countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.